This morning, January 22nd, is actually the feast day, the celebration of the life and witness of the Apostle Timothy. So those of you who might still be very close to Father Timothy Robinson, you should give him a call or text him and say, hey, happy name day, baby, because you know he's up in Sacramento now. Now, Timothy the Apostle was one of St. Paul's closest co-workers in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And St. Paul actually addressed Timothy in the two letters he wrote to Timothy that are in our Bibles. Timothy, my true child in the faith. Or Timothy, my son. And it's why we read from St. Paul's first letter to Timothy this morning. Now we have two letters that St. Paul wrote to Timothy in our Bibles. And I'd urge you to go home today and read them both. They're not very long. Not very long at all. Maybe ten chapters between them. But you know, chapters in the Bible are pretty short. So it'd be really easy for you all to do. Now, who was the Apostle Timothy? So his name in Greek means the man who honors God. He was born in Lystra, which is a town in Asia Minor, in what we today would call the modern state of Turkey. And the book of Acts tells us that Timothy was born of a Jewish mother, Evniki. That's where we get the name Eunice from in English. Evniki. A woman of Jewish background who had become a Christian together with her mother, Lois, as a result of the preaching and teaching of St. Paul when he passed through that region on his second missionary journey. So Timothy's father, we discover though, was a Greek and a non-believer. A religiously mixed marriage, we might say today. But Timothy, nonetheless, was raised in a household where the name of Christ was lifted up. And there's a certain sense in which we could almost speak of Timothy as a third-generation Christian, given that his mother and grandmother were both Christians. And St. Paul describes their faith. And he says that their faith most English translations say was sincere. The Greek word, from my point of view, is stronger. Anipokritos. Literally, without hypocrisy. In other words, Timothy's faith, his mother Eunice's faith, his grandmother Lois's faith, was real. It was a deep faith, and they practiced what they believed. And this was at a time when Christians were being executed for their faith, left and right. Now, what was some of the context of St. Paul's two letters to Timothy that we have in our Bibles? Well, St. Paul is writing his two letters to Timothy sometime probably between 65 and 67 AD, when he's already in prison in Rome, waiting for his trial and his eventual execution for the crime of being a Christian under the Roman Emperor Nero. He burned half the city of Rome down. You know that, right? Nero burned half of the city of Rome down and then said, the Christians did it. Nice man. What did it mean to be a Christian in Nero's Rome? So, Christians were used, once he began the persecutions, to light Nero's imperial gardens at night. What do I mean by that? They were crucified, hung throughout his gardens where he walked, covered with oil, and then lit up by soldiers to become human torches, burnt to death for Nero's evening entertainment. The Apostle Peter was crucified upside down in the Colosseum. The Apostle Paul would be beheaded. So these letters are, in a very real sense, St. Paul's last will and testament to his disciple Timothy. He's passing the baton to the next generation of Christian leaders. Now, Timothy was to become the first bishop of the city of Ephesus. And he was appointed so by the Apostle Paul. And those of you who went with me to Ephesus, Barbara, no, you didn't go to that? Oh my gosh, who went with me to Ephesus? Did anybody here? Ah, Georgia, I should have known. Yes, 
Well, you missed something. Barbara. Wayne, you'll have to take her there. Okay? You have, to, you, have to, you have to get her there. So if you go to Ephesus today, it's one of the world's most important archaeological sites. And when we walk down the streets of that ancient city, ancient Roman streets, more than 2,000 years old, we were walking on the streets that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Timothy walked on. That's pretty amazing. The Third Ecumenical Council was held in Ephesus <coughs> in the year 431, forgive me. Ephesus was a pretty important city in the ancient Roman world and an important city for Christians. Now, Timothy, just so you know, as the leader of the Christians in Ephesus, as their bishop and apostle, he was eventually stoned to death by an angry mob who were the worshipers of the fertility goddess Artemis. And in the ancient world, the temple dedicated to Artemis in Ephesus was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Today, the only thing that survives is one column out in the middle of nowhere in a swamp. But what do St. Paul's two letters to Timothy talk about? Tim Blasides, this is your name day, right? You know that, right? Okay. What did St. Paul's two letters to Timothy talk about? What insights does Paul offer to Timothy, knowing that he's going to die? What advice does the older apostle give to this young man? Remember, St. Paul writes to him, don't let other people despise your youth or look down on you because you're young. He was probably only in his 20s, early 20s probably when he became the leader of the Christians in Ephesus, their bishop and their apostle. Now, the apostle Paul, in these two letters, he says a lot of stuff. He gives the qualifications for being a bishop and the qualifications for being a deacon. Think of Deacon Dan. When I had to write a letter for his ordination, I had to write a letter that included the apostle Paul writing to Timothy what was expected of a deacon. That still stands in our church all the way to this day. He also writes about, in these letters, what it means to be a presbyter. That's my title. It just means old guy. And actually, years ago, Bishop Anthony, the late Bishop Anthony, gave me the title proto-presbyter. And that means, George, you're going to love this, first among the old guys. Okay? That's really all that means. We are a church full of meaningless titles, oftentimes. But the reality of our faith in Christ has to be here, has to be present in all of you. Um, he writes about presbyters. That word, by the way, is normally translated as elder in your English Bibles, but it's a reference to the office of the priesthood. Um, he writes about the need for the church to care for widows. And in today's reading, he even says... There's a very real need for Timothy as a leader to set the example of what it means to actually be a Christian in speech, Paul writes, in other words, by what he says, in conduct, Paul writes, in other words, by how he lives his life, and he goes on to say, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, there was also a need in Timothy's day to constantly preach and teach the truth about the Lord Jesus in order to dispel all the false teachings about him that were being spread around. Godless myths is what St. Paul calls them. And do we not have a lot of wild and crazy false teachers today? Do you think we do? We surely do. You have to think for a moment about TV preachers, for example. So, I have to do this. I have to make fun of this poor man. His name is Crefo Dollar. A number of years ago, he looked out on his congregation and he said, I need a $65 million private jet in order to get me from one place to the next. And his congregation, from my point of view, was actually foolish enough to give the money to purchase that jet. <laughs> 
Now, can you imagine the Lord Jesus going to the disciples and saying, hey, I need a better mode of transportation. What can you get me, you guys? Can you imagine him doing that? No. So the very first thing you need to understand is that when you hear it, first of all, if you're watching this guy on TV, stop right now. <laughs> Don't ever go to that TV program again. Stop. But I will say to you that all of that is talked about actually in St. Paul's letters to Timothy. False teachers spreading false promises and asking for exorbitant, ridiculous things. He talks about that in these letters. Now, he says, and remember, this is St. Paul writing 2,000 years ago. He says, Timothy, you're going to have to preach at a time when peoples are lovers of self, lovers of money, arrogant, swollen with conceit, slanderers, haters of whatever is good, ungrateful, unholy, loving their own pleasure more than loving God. That's the world that St. Paul told Timothy you've got to preach the gospel in. Sounds a lot like our world, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like our world. But this is precisely why we as Christians are called to be different. Christians are called to be humble, not arrogant, not haters of whatever is good, but lovers of whatever is good and right and true. We are called to be grateful, not ungrateful. We are called to be holy, not unholy. Christians, St. Paul says in his second letter to Timothy, are to be rich in good works, generous, and always willing to share. Always willing to share. In this morning's reading, St. Paul reminds Timothy of his ordination. When the presbyters, the elders, laid their hands on him. And in 2 Timothy, St. Paul writes once again to remind Timothy of his ordination. And there he writes, Rekindle the gift of God that is within you. In other words, the Holy Spirit given at ordination. <coughs> Rekindle that gift that I gave you through the laying on of my hands. Now that gesture, the laying on of hands for ordination, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for ordination, that is still done in the life of our church all the way to the present day. Paul did it to Timothy. Timothy did it to other bishops. Bishops, all the way to the present day, have been ordaining people in exactly that same fashion. Deacon Dan, when he was ordained as a deacon, hands were laid on him by the bishop about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Father Theophanes was ordained as a priest, the bishop laid hands on him and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And that also includes me. So that's been passed on in the life of our church from one generation to the next for 2,000 years. And that's part of what we would call, although it's more a Roman Catholic phrase than ours, apostolic succession. Now, the three of us, we were all ordained by the laying on of hands. We were all given the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's been continually passed on in the life of the church all the way up to the day to serve you, to build up the body of Christ here at St. Paul's, to preach, to teach, to remind you of who you are and who you're called to be as believers in Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. God bless you. Now, peace be with you. No, not also with you. Even Catholics don't say that anymore. Doris, what happened, baby? Uh, uh, get on your daughter for me, will you please? Well, good morning, everybody.